Okay, so we have another episode of uh, live software architecture design. Um, this is a design review of quantum computing capabilities. Uh, I'm not sure I even believe in quantum computers as real things, but we can certainly simulate what a quantum computer would do, and it's interesting from a the point of view of understanding quantum mechanics and other things. And if there are, in fact, quantum computing APIs that work, well, then we should be able to connect to them. OK, so we are, uh, we've looked at this several times before, but let's walk through what we actually have here. So here's an example. Let's remember how this works. Why is my cursor spinning like that? That is not a good sign. What is going on here? Is that something to do with? Let me just see. Oh, I'm running this in 11.3. Maybe I should be running it in 11.2. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so here goes. Um, all right. So let's understand what this is. So quantum discrete state. Zero goes to zero one. Wait a minute. Why is my cursor running again here? Something very bad is happening. Um, this is really odd. I think this is something to do with the chat tools that I installed from our previous meeting. Well, let's hope for the best here. Um, OK. So can, can you walk through, Jacob, can you walk through what, what this is actually supposed to be doing? Absolutely. So uh, this notebook that you're looking at contains three more involved, just slightly more involved examples of the capabilities of the quantum computing package um, that we've been developing. Um, these three examples, the first one is Deutsch's algorithm, which is one of the first things historically um, that was a demonstration of quantum supremacy, um, the ability of quantum computers to do things using fewer resources, um, ideally, than classical computers. Right, but let's look at what this actually says. So we've got yeah. quantum discrete state. And the idea is that that is saying this thing that is named, this wire that is named 0 can be in state 0 or 1. Is that correct? Or this? Mm -hmm. OK. And so, so, is, so I'm saying you're going to initialize two wires um, and you're going to look at this like the product of those wires as being your current state then you take any boolean function acting on two variables uh, on a single variable of which there are four and you want to figure out if that boolean function is balanced or if it's okay. constant okay hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on let's start off with trying to understand what this actually is okay okay so this is a shorthand for entering a quantum discrete state with a wire name of one, so to speak. What do we call, what is what are, better than the word wire? What are we calling that thing? What are we calling the named thing there? Uh, we, I, I think that we decided on quantum entity. Or okay. Something like that. Is that actually named? Do we, is no. that for our documentation or we just, uh, that's just, okay, fine. So the quantum entity has two possible states. And so now here, where does it record that quantum entity name in this quantum discrete state output here? So that's where the one is. Um, in the qubit dimensions, one goes to two. If you change oh, okay. the one in, your, in the definition over there, if you just change it to W, then it, W would pop up. Yeah, OK, fine. I get it. OK, very good. OK, so this state vector is representing for that particular by default, the thing is what? In equally in both possible states or what? No, so the first one is just in the, the lower. Uh, so the D0 is in one state and D1 is in another state. Um, these are in basis states in this uh, you know, uh, privileged basis that we're talking about. OK, but uh, so this, the basis is defined by the list 1, 0, right? Exactly. And so that. This quantum discrete state corresponds to, so how would I see, um, is there some way of displaying some aspect of this, you know, what, what, the, uh, what the amplitudes are for different 
Yes. So if you do, um, and this is something that uh, we've been talking about, um, me and Jose, Xavier, and Caesar, um, but we had not decided on what the cutoff was going to be. We thought that for states that were small enough and um, below some cutoff, we would display the state um, vector explicitly. Um, so if you type in D1 of one uh, comma, then in parentheses, state vector. Why is it parentheses? What do you mean? One comma, and then you mean you mean in quotes? Yeah, yeah, in quotes, in quotes, okay. state vector. Uh, you need to do double, double brackets around. Wait a minute, what am I doing here? Uh, just the first an element of that, not not quotations around one. So, okay, like this. Yeah. Okay. And then just normal. Okay. So I think this comes from the time in which we were storing the density matrix. Right. So it was natural to have sparse arrays, but now for small vectors, it's not so natural to have sparse arrays. So we were right. wondering whether it would be... I don't think it's necessary to have... I mean, it doesn't really matter whether... Look, it's an array, and whether it's a sparse array or, a, or an explicit dense array, those are sort of equivalent things. So we can perfectly well have the... You know, by default, we can use dense arrays unless it's obviously silly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and just my... to update you briefly, um, uh, the right now you notice here that there's this. These are state vectors. Um, now we still have the capability to do density matrices, and in fact, um, this the I've in, uh, actually coded up um, and put into this the ability for the package to. Um, go back and forth between density matrices and state vectors. Um, so when you um, when you create a mixed state of state vectors, it automatically turns that into okay, a... Okay, so if I say density matrix here, what's it going to do? That's not going to do anything. Um, because it isn't sitting there. It doesn't. It, the density matrix is not an element of this, but it seems to me... So this is a pure state. So really all the information you need to describe it is the state vector. No, I understand that, but what I'm what I'm suggesting is, if I if I take D one and I query it for its state vector, why isn't that just working? I mean, why wouldn't that be a, a reasonable thing to do? That should be a reasonable thing, and I can okay, add that. Fine. All right, okay, so let's do that. But then, why don't you also let it query for a density matrix? Um, because if you think about so if you had something that was only in a density matrix form, so for instance, a mixed state, yep. it wouldn't make sense to query that for a state vector. That's fine. So it says missing, not, a, not um, you know, doesn't exist. Okay. All right. I mean, that seems like a useful thing because it's like, like what would be the right thing? I mean, missing. Yeah, um, not applicable. Not applicable? You think that's the right? I mean, that's a kind of a quantum philosophy question, right? What is the, what is the state vector of a mixed state? It, it's not defined. It's ill-defined. Okay, but, but walk me through that. I mean, I, I know perfectly well what the quantum mechanics is, but I'm trying to understand. Not applicable doesn't seem like the right thing, because not applicable would suggest that there is something structurally wrong with asking the question. Whereas not defined, I mean, what it really is, is that the mixed state is not representable by a state vector. Right, right. Okay, so what's the right way to say that in terms of, you know, if you ask for it, it's, hmm, what is the right term? Uh, do you get my question? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, now, if you wanted to query this for its von Neumann entropy or for its purity, you could do that. Fine, right. And it would say it's, it's entropy. If it was a pure state, its entropy would be zero, presumably. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. So, okay, well, anyway, so we, we want to say, let's see. Um, what would it be? I mean, at the, at the beginning, we would say not available, but I don't think that's very good because it, it would be nice to be able to, um, it would be nice to somehow crisply represent the physics of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, anyway, let, let's put that on the side for a minute. For now, we okay. can say not available. Okay. Um, um, do you want to continue with this example? Go, go What's that? 
Would you like to continue with this example, or do you have other yeah, questions? I, I want to go on with this example, but I'm also I'm also wondering about the display of quantum discrete state. Right, and that's well, something that we had um, talked about, me and uh, Jose, Xavier, and Caesar, but we um, we hadn't just uh, figured out exactly what type of uh, uh, description box we wanted um, to okay. use. And I mean, okay, all right, but l let's let's go through this, and, and if we have Jeremy, do we have Jeremy here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, you can wake up if you weren't already. <laughs> okay. Um, because we're about to get to what we're trying to represent graphically here. Okay, so we've got a Boolean function here. That is a what? Isn't that a, a Boolean function number one of one variable, right? Yep. Exactly. So if I say something like this, it'll do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now quantum circuit. Deutsch comma F. So that just creates the quantum circuit. Um, that is um, just basically, this is the, the circuit you want to use um, in order to figure out if this Boolean function is balanced or constant. Um, and that means basically you want to see if F of zero is equal to F of one or if they're different um, without even knowing what F of zero and F of one are. And in quantum mechanics, you can do that um, you can yeah. you can with right. one call to the function, um, and that U of F. This is part of the design thing. Um, I would like for multi-qubit um, or qubit operations to be one box instead of multiple boxes on different things. Um, uh, so it would be great if we could do that. But this is one call. Oh, so, so can I take this thing, whatever it is? And apply it. Yes, I can the, apply uh, it. Yes. The, so uh, I applied it to your it was, state. It was a product. Okay, so let's just do that. So then this thing here. So does this work to just take this uh, to copy this, or does that not work yet? Or is that just a graph? Uh, I don't think that works yet. Okay. So do we understand? Okay, so that that's the thing that needs to be set up so that that actually works. So the thing is a you know both input and output form. Right. Okay. So that you can pick it up and actually, okay. So applying that to this quantum discrete state, we get. Right. And so that, that tells that, you that. That's some kind of debug printout. Uh, yes, that was a, that is a debug printout. Yes. Okay, fine. So we'll ignore that. Okay. So here, uh, I don't really know how to interpret this. I mean, okay. So this is QDIT dimensions. So this is saying. That's the exact same thing we had before. Um, it's okay, just so another wire kind of... one is a two has dimension two and wire wire zero quantum entity zero and quantum entity one both have dimension two. Exactly. So now this state vector hopefully is something more exciting than uh, so if I now go here, what I should be able to do is just to say state vector, but for right now I have to say one comma state vector, right? Yeah. Okay, and then I make that the normal of that then what I should get. Now, what is that? So that is because you're dealing with now, if you go back to the product state up there, D, yeah. instead of D0 or D1, you would also have something with four entries because you're looking at the product of two qubit states. Um, and so- um, Why are those indexed? Why are they unraveled? Why are the indices unraveled like that? Why is this not a two by two? Because- when you describe entangled oh, yeah, state, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. It's a single state vector whose indices are zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, exactly. one. Exactly. Correct. And, and so, exactly. is there any way of seeing what those indices of the state vector are? So, if you do quantum plot of Deutsch of D or quantum plot of D, or maybe it might be quantum discrete. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's lovely, but I'm going to ask for a different thing, which is, I think it would be good to have a query of the quantum discrete state that would tell you for the state vector what essentially the labels of each of the elements of the state vector are. Okay. So how would those be represented? Those, those are themselves little product states, is that right? Yes, those are basis, element, basis product state elements. So are those elements themselves quantum discrete states? In other words, the label of that guy is basically a quantum discrete state. Is that not correct? Uh, so you can think of it that way, but we don't want to actually do that because then we would have 
um, a bunch of these quantum discrete states uh, with the wire labels and all the other information nested within our yeah well i mean but 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 remember that's a query it's a it's a computation it doesn't have to be something that's always there okay right so so the sub value of quantum discrete state with something like um what would be the right uh it could be just basis isn't that right i mean it's the basis for the state vector okay yes and this is something that we had as part of our state description originally um and we decided to get rid of that. So now I think you're right that this is this is the right way to do it. Um, but so um, we can query for the basis. Exactly. But then why don't we also have a thing, another query, which is something like basis labels. And that can be those those cats and so on here. Does that Absolutely. Make sense? You're totally, I, I'm totally on board. Right. Okay, so, so in terms of how those are actually done, would those be strings effectively? of the cats or what how would we do that uh, actually what, what they would be no no what they should be um how do we even do one of those cats is there a cat yes there is so if yes. i just say cat of a so then what this would be is probably because the zero and one might be all kinds of ornate stuff i mean you might have pictures of smiley faces in there and so on because the yeah. labels of the states don't have to be zeros and ones mm -hmm. so probably the correct thing to do is a cat of some kind of um what would it be, a row box? I mean, is it right to put a comma in there or would, would it be better to simply have a thing that looks like this? I mean, I would have thought it was more natural, more textbooky to just have that, or am I wrong? Oh, I didn't even know you could do that. That's great. Um, you can have cat comma a comma b. Oh, we can? Yeah. Okay, well, so the question is, which of those is the better notation? Anybody got an opinion about? I mean, this one is clearer because if if the if the sub labels yeah. were zero 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 one, then you understand what's what. Exactly. I, I was going to say that. Fine. Okay. Then then these are. I mean, maybe what we should call this instead of basis labels, we should call it actually basis cats, because mm -hmm. they are in fact cats. I mean, I don't know whether we mean whether we're whether we're taking cat to actually mean anything. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Right now, it's just a representation. Another possibility would be to use actual tensor products of cats. Right, right, right. Which is okay. So look, um, so so what you've got, you've got several possibilities here. So we can either the basis as explicit quantum discrete states, in which case we might want to call it basis states, which then okay. gives us a list of quantum discrete states. Right. And then we might want, possibly, um, ugh, well, I don't know, basis cats, which might be individual cats. And then what you're also proposing, what, what is the way of representing the, out, the direct product with a, with a circle times type thing? I would say tensor product. We have a tensor product head. What does it do usually? It's, it's a form of outer. Uh, specializing in symbolic tensors. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So then we can have as an alternative label here. So if we call it basis cats, and then the final one would be, actually, actually, look, all of these make sense. Um, because okay. basis labels, in this case, would be simply no ketting going on, just something like zero one or zero comma one. You get what I'm saying? Without mm -hmm. any, because that's what you want. I mean, putting the cat stuff around it is, is amusing, but not necessarily. Um, uh, okay, so if we say basis labels, basis cats and basis products perhaps. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on that? Is uh, Jose, say basis, basis cat product. Basis well, yeah, okay, fine. Basis cat products, fine. Okay, all right, let's move on. So let's go back now to the visual presentation of both of these things. I mean, this thing I, I, I don't like very much. What, what right. are those? So those are, those are various gates, right? Right, so this was just my hack for now, waiting for the design. Okay, all right, well, let, let's go through then 
what what how do i get one of those gates uh, so if you just um, type in uh, quantum discrete operation um, and then you put um, in, in quotations um, why is this not auto completing okay um, boy there's a lot of random functions there i hope we don't need all of those okay go so, ahead yes. what, what? Um, so if you put in hadamard and then you put as the next argument just like uh, w1 and that's it okay so that is a representation of a hadamard gate operating on quantum entity of w1 exactly so to actually see this in operation if i were to apply it to d0 for example it would say forget it because d0 is a different do not input overlap. wires they do not overlap with the, uh, the input wires for quantum. Is system. it right to generate a message, or is it is it should it just silently do nothing? I, I'm I not mean, sure. I don't know. It depends on how things are constructed. That, that's. But let, let's. Okay. So if I were to do this, let's say I were to create this Hadamard gate on wire one, then if I say D one here, that uh, it will apply the Hadamard gate to that basis state exactly that was created there and now i mean this quantum plot which yeah. i claim should actually be the you know basically we should have i don't see why quantum discrete state shouldn't as part of its visual representation essentially show the quantum plot is there any reason not to uh I mean, no you're right it should the I mean, you want to be able to get all these pieces out, but it's okay to have, you know, this, this, um, yeah, okay, all right. So there may be some other sort of queries that you want to do here. So one clearly state vector, I mean, another query here is what well, we know about state vector, right? Um, we also know about density matrix. Um, I can write out QDS of density matrix. Um, and then, uh, well, I mean, we also might as well say, um, you know, as one of the queries here, we can say, I don't know whether it something like pure state Q, effectively. Yeah. So right now, I have um, uh, purity as one of the things. So if you type in just purity of, of whatever the state is, it'll give you, it'll spit out a number. Um, and if that number is one, then it's a pure state. And I also have um, the uh, a, a query uh, implemented as a separate function, I think, right now. Uh, I may have gotten rid of that um, just to have – it should be all the way at the bottom. Uh, yeah. Yeah, quantum pure state Q. Yeah, I mean, this is a decision we have to make is how many of these subsidiary functions do we want to have? Right, and we don't necessarily need that one. We I, I just thought that it may be redundant to have um, to be querying for um, purity and for you know pure state Q. Right. Um. Somebody from our live stream Omega number asked the question: Is this mostly reproducing the already existing Munoz Delgado quantum package? Or is there new functionality? Um, does anybody know about that package? Mm, I don't. So I, I can tell you that that package did not have the ability to go back and forth between the state vector and the density matrix. It didn't have the ability to deal with QDITs, um, these you know spin D over two systems, which mine like inherently does. Um, and it makes it easy to deal with those. Uh, my so news is that you know about that package and the answer is this does more than that package exactly okay i mean look the the main thing for those interested i mean the main thing we're trying to do here is to make a very nice clean design that builds on a lot of work that's been done a lot of work been done by all sorts of people over the years with quantum computing and wolfram language and mathematica exactly and this, is, this is i mean you know we, we are basically trying to do the um uh, kind of the summary job building on everything that's already been done. Exactly. Uh, and, uh, okay. 
onward. Um, all right. So, so Jeremy, this is this. We're now we're talking graphical stuff here. So this is a typical representation of um, a quantum. See what what's bugging me? You know, for example, for a neural net. Okay, let, let's just compare what we do for neural nets. Okay, because I don't think you know. While we're still in playtime with quantum computing, this is fine. But when it's beyond playtime, I don't think this representation is going to work very well. I mean, let, let's look, look at a pretty simple, and remember, our goal here is to make a, um, actually, the real thing we really want is a, is a um, quantum neural net operating on the uh, Ethereum blockchain. There we have, then we'd have all buzzwords hit in a single <laughs> object. Yeah. Also CRISPR. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Yes, yes, CRISPR meets blockchain meets quantum neural net. Okay, in any case, but but this is, you know, for even a fairly small neural net. Now, uh, admittedly, okay, this has lots of weights and things in it, but this representation of a pipeline of operations is, I think, a much more plausible... I, actually, there are two things I want to understand. In the case of neural nets, we have the concept of a net chain and we have the concept of a net graph. And in the future, we will have the concept of essentially functional programming constructs operating on, uh, you know, that, that allow you to have things like variables that are being used to connect different parts of the computation. What we've got here is something analogous to net chain, I think. My question, is there an analog of net graph? Now, it will have certain constraints because of reversibility, but is there an analog of net graph or is it always just kind of daisy chains of operations? Uh, right now, there is no analog of net graph. In, in this system, but in, in I mean, in the, so what happens here, every quantum entity has certain gates that operate on it, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get interaction between these quantum entities? You perform, you use multi-qubit gates. So right now, because I just was hacking my way through the this illustration, um, this so for instance, CX right there, it looks like it's acting on on uh, the first. I see, but it really extends to the second wire. As exactly. Well. Okay, but so in general, the way this works is something can connect two wires that are not adjacent, right? Exactly. And so the way that that's represented in the, the literature um, is with uh, like straight lines going down with circles or X's connecting them. And right. those so, so this is very analogous to sorting networks, which we have, I mean, for good reason, it's analogous to sorting networks. I mean, if we look up, I wonder whether, do we have a, do we have those in the data repository yet? I was meaning to make sure those weren't in the data repository. Anybody know that they managed to make it in there? Um, well, anyway, let, let's, let's take a look here. Um, let me see here. Here we go. Um, so those are sorting networks. So those are a visual representation of something um, very much like this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's worth, Jeremy, seeing how these things work because this is, okay, let's run the sorting network thing. Um, And it's actually um, really interesting that you bring this up because something that I was going to talk about, um, Caesar and uh, Xavier and Jose and I, we had been talking about how and if we wanted to generalize this to just discrete quantum uh, mechanics in general and not just quantum computing. Um, and one of the things that I think may, we may want to look into um, is uh, generic tensor networks for quantum states. Mm -hmm. um, and because a quantum circuit is just a special case of a tensor network. Um, Explain a tensor network to me. Um, so a tensor network is a, a way to represent uh, different, uh, different tensors um, such that you can perform operations on them um, very simply. Um, but so so what, what kind of tensor? I mean, this is a tensor as in a symbolic tensor with a certain number of legs or what? Exactly. So it has a certain number of arms and a certain number of legs. Think it's like a certain number of covariant and a certain number of contravariant indices. Okay. Um, and you can perform contractions. You can perform. Um, what, what does that have to do with quantum mechanics? I mean, there's a whole formalism. I mean, like Roger Penrose had this whole formalism of exactly. That. So a quantum circuit is is merely 
a specific instance of a tensor network where all the, the gates are tensors um, and these wires are performing contractions of them in essence. Okay. Jose, do you want to make a, a any helpful comment about this? In, um... I'm not sure I can. I can imagine that that this is referring to matrices mainly and the and the and the operators being represented as matrices well so for example we have here i i've just pulled up a paper here quantum tensor networks in a nutshell oh yeah i've seen this this so this is and these are very useful for um lots of things in condensed matter physics and high energy physics nowadays um but i again this is not something that I'm attached to, but I was wondering if this is something. Oh, I mean, it obviously makes some sense to do this, uh, especially, I mean, the, in general, I don't understand these pictures. Do you understand these pictures? Uh, I actually read through a bunch of this the other day, this exact paper. Um, so okay. basically just, it's showing you the type of things that the diagram uh, denotes, like how, uh, what type of things are, equivalent to what other things um, and okay so so for example these are successively elided forms let me just capture this picture for example mm -hmm. those are um, uh, um, let's see um, those are successively elided forms of some kind of way of representing these networks is that correct mm -hmm. so if we're going to represent these things I mean because because my point is, you know, while you just have a toy network that's just for examples, you know, where you've only got three operations or something, this is going to work fine. But when you have something more serious, which who knows, maybe, you know, in the next, you know, maybe nobody will ever implement. But but uh, your point is that also for purely theoretical purposes, these representations of things, I mean, you know, my point about this whole system is that, you know, this whole quantum computing system is that whether or not quantum computers get built it's still a useful formalism for all kinds of purposes, and you're supporting that by the discussion of this. So this is, so So here, you, okay, so these are some states for which we have reasonable representations, like these GHC states, mm -hmm. right, correct? Yeah, um, exactly. So we obviously need to understand this. So explain to me, oh my gosh, what is all this stuff? Okay, how about you start at the beginning here and just explain to me what this is? Uh, well, yeah. so this is, this was only one of the things that I was uh, wanting to discuss. Um, there's a, a ton of other things. Um, okay. Well, um, okay, but I think this is going to be important. And okay, what we're going to get, we'll. I think this is going to be important in understanding, you know, what the graphical representation of any of these things is. Okay. Um, in fact, I don't really see how we can get away without that. In what okay. sense? So, just explain to me the covariant and contravariant index idea here. Is that is that is covariant and contravariant indices? Does that relate to spin a half, or is that not? The fact that there are two indices, explain to me what what um, you know what does covariant and contravariant mean in this context? Uh, so, it's like a vector and a dual vector. Uh, yeah, and I understand what it means in the usual general relativity manifolds, et cetera, yeah. et cetera context. Okay. But what does it mean in the case of a quantum, in, in this quantum case? Uh, in the quantum case the covariant and contravariant indices don't mean much if in, except for the fact that these things end up being b matrices. Um, like these, you know, like D by D type things instead of just um, D elements um, as your quantum gates. But well, so, so is that is what you're saying that the fact that you're using two indices to represent the thing is that I don't understand. Is that something? Uh, my, my, impre my impression here is that these matrices used here are always of the type one index up, one index down, and this exactly. introduces a restriction such that you have to always contract the one index up and one index down. Exactly. So, so some, point, somehow you, you have to be very careful not to transpose the operators because you would end up contracting the wrong indices. Right. But is that one index up, one index down, is that something that is representing, what is the current, what is the correspondence between this wires representation? So here we appear to have something which appears to be applying. So these appear to be different quantum entities, so to speak, 
and this appears to be applying operations. I don't know what that plus operation is. Those That's are apply control mod. what's that? That's a control mod operation. Okay, fine. So it's applying those operations three times and that's that representation. So that will be something similar to the representation that we have here, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then this is some kind of a lighted form of that representation. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, somebody is um, uh, saying, uh, yeah, some, somebody is saying that they would appreciate it if we supported this first form here. Yeah, we agree. We're going to have a form like this. Um, the, the question is, when things get more complicated, what do we do? And I don't completely understand. So, so this here, where you've got these successive operations all appearing to occur at the same time, is kind of funky. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure at this point what... The right thing to do is okay well let's let's just take a look i mean okay so but in what sense in what sense does a tensor network generalize a circuit what is more general about a tensor network than a circuit so in a tensor network in general you're not just dealing with things that have one upper and one lower index you're dealing with you know things that have you know k upper and and, and lower indices. Okay, but what's the difference between that and a gate that just takes a random you know doesn't just take in in, in general what you're saying is you can have something which takes you know k inputs and produces m outputs right mm -hmm. which is which can be represented by a tensor in your formalism with a certain number of covariant certain number of contravariant indices mm -hmm. So these, uh, in general, these multi or more than two index tensors um, in networks are very useful for representing many body quantum physics. Um, for instance, if you look at um, like this paper even talks about the PEPS, these um, uh, entangled product states. Yep. Um, and for those type of things, you need much more complicated tensor networks um, in order to describe the, the physics that's going on, but that's actually the most compact uh, way to describe the physics that's going on. Okay, well, that's interesting, but, but okay. But so for our purposes, the way we should think about it is that those things are going to be operations that don't just span, that don't just pick up two things here, but might pick up three things and produce three things as output and so on. I mean, in the quantum, yes. in, the, in the standard quantum pure state business, you're going to always have same number of inputs and outputs. Am I correct? Exactly. Okay. So looking at this diagram here, Jeremy, mm -hmm. what's happening here? So, so the color, which I don't consider very good here, is attempting to represent what, what persists to what, so to speak. Am I making sense? So like that, that wire connects to there, and then it does an operation, and then it's different, so to speak. Okay. They're swapping though, and this it's a little different because the right the those, those, those vertical swapping. bars just mean make yeah. a swap. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. But what these things here mean is do an operation where you take two bits in and you produce two bits out. It's directional, or where does the output go in that case? Well, what what happens is this is a function which takes two inputs and produces two outputs. Okay. So for example, right. controlled not. Okay. So you so can so think of this. What's significant about the open plus circle? If it's it's just a it's just a traditional notation for that particular kind of gate, and okay. and how many such gates are there, and what are their what are their representations? I mean, do all like like you know, for example, in Boolean algebra, you know, we have things like the NAND operation, which is you know, which we kind of decided to represent using this um, uh, this slightly funky ver you know thing here right so you're li you're very limited in the number of such things that you can use in quantum computing because all operations have to be reversible um so really you have things like the you have this uh not operation which the control is the line coming down from the dot um and then the not is the circle with the uh the lines through yeah, it right. but th these are two variable two input two output things it, but exactly. they're a composite constructs here which are considerably more complicated aren't there 
uh, so there, in general, there are not that many more complicated things if you stick to the, the traditional fault tolerant gates. Um, you have things like a swap operation, which is um, used, it is represented by um, like an, two X's, one on each of the, the wires and a line connecting them. So um, how traditional have these representations become? And what, um, uh, so if I look up like quantum gate um, uh, icons. Yeah, go for like, it. You'll see pretty much the same things everywhere. <laughs> if I look that up, this is what I get for quantum gate icons. That didn't work very well. I wonder uh, what um, uh, quantum circuits or quantum circuit. Quantum gate is probably Stargate or something. Um, quantum circuit diagrams. Okay, here we go. These are more more reasonable. Um, so the the thing at the end there in, in most of those um, is the measurement. Um, and that's how you. That's like the general measurement representation. The two lines. Um, that are like very close together. That means a classical operation, of which my thing I actually have, but I don't have a way of um, of visualizing that right now. Um, the X and Z are the Pauli operations. H is Hadamard. The line going down from that is again a control knot. All right. So These, there's there's some reasonable uh, commonality. Yeah. There's not that many. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So we probably should actually just use these traditional notations. Right. Uh, I personally think the non-italic look better, but but that's just a detail. Um, somebody on Swishcar on, on Twitch is saying there was a paper recently making connections between geometries of quantum circuits and neural nets. Um, if you can tell us the reference, we'd be interested to see it. I'd be interested to see it. Um, maybe. Maybe you know, Jacob, do you know what that paper is? Do you want me to uh, I don't. I would love to see it as well. Okay. So whoever Swishka is, if, you, if you're hearing this, do send us the, uh, a link to it. <laughs> Thank um, you. The, uh, um, let's see. So, so back to this. So it sounds like, I mean, let, let me just capture an example here. Um, you know, it sounds like we should be trying to make graphics that pretty much look something like this. Mm -hmm. But that seems like it's become conventional enough that that's what we should do. Exactly. Um, fair enough. So, okay, so do you have, do you have what you need to be able to start doing that? I mean, I, these, these don't seem to me like they need a heck of a lot of graphic design. I mean, Jeremy, do you want to comment on this? Is there anything... I mean, the only thing I find a little weird about this is the is the fact that the horizontal quantum entity representation is no different from the representation of these vertical things. That seems kind of goofy to me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe we can have a way of differentiating them. Um, well, one of them could be gray, for example, thicker and grayer or something like sure. this. For example, these quantum, the problem is that because these things are, these sort of attachment points are just, I don't understand, what is this one here? That this is a control. So that means knot. that you have a control, control knot operation, which is a Toffoli, really. Okay. So there's not that many different representations. Uh, there's not that many different graphics we need for this because it's the same couple of gates that you're using over and over again. Okay. And what are these things here? So V is a uh, square root X. So it's, it's the root of a the Pauli X matrix. Um, and why is it called V? That's just what it's called. Um, what is it? Is I, it in, in German or something like, like, like PD, you know, SPDF or something or <laughs> form of that? I, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. All right. Um, I think I look it up. Okay. All right. But, Okay, so if we think we're just going to have quantum circuits simply display as one of these traditional diagrams, that's then the story of that. We don't yet know what we're going to have a, a, a state display as. Is there any conventional way to display a state? Uh, not particularly when you're dealing with, you know, when you could have uh, pure states and uh, mixed I, 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 I'm sorry, I want to make another comment. This representation here of the name of the quantum entity, 
as the input. It's useful to label the name of the quantum entity. Right. So that's what I have the hack of, if you look at the circuit right above that. Yeah, what does that mean, zero A? So that's just, I, I was labeling the wire as um, like wire A, which we're initializing as being in the zero quantum state. Well, what are these? Are these the initializers here? Yeah. I see. So there's two different things here. There's the label of what the wire is. So it might say A off on the left here, and then there's the initializer. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that they've chosen not to show all the initializers at the beginning is probably cutesy, but perhaps unnecessary. Sure. Is that, do you agree with that statement? I mean, it, it, yes, it, I, yeah. I agree with that statement. Okay. Um, so, okay. So then what we expect is that we'll have, uh, you know, an initializer, this triangle seems like a pretty decent representation of that. We should check whether there are others. Um, then, uh, but with the label, you know, with the name of the thing right at the beginning here, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether we need a colon or something after the name, followed by all this stuff. We need a convention for how to represent, uh, Jeremy, do you have any great ideas? You, you understand what's going on here. These quantum entities are just, you know, I mean, in a, okay, deep inside a modern quantum computer, what might one of these entities be? It might be an atom or something. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. this is sort of, this is the kind of the, the, the world line of an atom, so to speak. Mm -hmm here and then this thing here represents the interaction between two atoms according to this um uh you know this operation so the right. question is how do we want to represent and again the analog in the in the um uh sorting network the thing that's interesting about i mean if you look at this diagram here one of the things that's kind of yucky about it in my view is it's kind of hard to see how long well i mean if you start looking at it, you can see how long that wire survived without operations. Honestly, this color thing didn't work very well here. And maybe that's not, you know, an important thing to capture. I mean, how long are the longest of quantum operations that people talk about right now, how long are the longest diagrams that people seriously use? There are very long diagrams that extend to multiple lines. Um, so I don't know what we want to do in that case. Um, well, we need to figure that out. I'm glad you right. mentioned that. Um, so I had not, I mean, none of the examples that I've sh shown here um, actually span that much distance. Okay, um, so, so one issue there, you know, it's, it's easier to go down the page than across the page. But the traditional representation of quantum... No, I understand that, but we can certainly have an option to draw the diagram down the page. I mean, or do people usually just go, you know, line by line, chopping it up? They go line by line, like reading sheet music. I see. Um, ah. Okay, this is the paper, The Geometry of Deep Learning. Okay, why is this relevant? Okay. I mean, these are the these are diagrams that we have decided not to use for neural networks. Although maybe this is a more elegant. I mean, you know, a lot of papers have these kinds of diagrams, although they seem to be going out of fashion because people are having, you know, because the things are getting a bit too complicated. So I don't understand the relevance of this. What is what is? I mean, this is all stuff about traditional neural net. Hmm. Well, this is interesting, actually. This is interesting. Hmm. Well, I don't, I don't completely understand. I don't understand the relevance of this to the quantum case. I'll have um, to look into that. Okay, but let, let's just, um, I mean, just curious here. Yeah, so I mean, this is really just, this is something we already have. I mean, we already have the graph. In neural nets, we can extract the graph of the neural net. Um, and what's interesting here, I suppose, is that this is the kind of representation. I mean, look, what we're seeing in the neural net case with something like this, that is the stacked version 
of something very much like what you're talking about here, because this is a bunch of tensors, basically. They don't happen to have, yeah, it's a bunch of tensors. Um, that bunch of tensor operations stacked up. Am I making sense? Whereas mm -hmm. your, um, and what you've got are a bunch of, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, humph, okay. Well, there's something to understand there. I think we can make something very nice in general. But in terms of having it break multiple lines, um, you know, if we build the right typesetting constructs, it will just break. I, I think we can make it. Wow, how would we do that? Um, I'm pretty sure. Does anybody want to comment on that? Jose, do you happen to know? I mean, we need a different set of people to really address that properly. But if we wanted to have, um, the question is, if we broke this in terms of the actual, yeah, it's, it's going to be complicated, right? Because it's going to have to have a, doesn't it have to have a multi-line function? Gosh, I haven't thought about these. Rows might, might work. Would a row work? Perhaps you will show uh, the beginning and the rest on hovering. I don't know. That seems that seems too funky. Um, uh, the um, let me see. I think that's. I don't think that's good. I mean, let's let's try to understand. Okay, so you're saying, Jeremy, just row. Well, let's just try row of table of x comma two hundred. Okay, so that just worked. Yeah, it should line wrap. I mean, the trick is if things change height, you know, you get, well, I, would this ever expand a number of lines or is it? No, I think, but I think the real problem is that you really want to have, uh, well, so, I mean, it'll, it'll indent, but the real thing is you might, well, maybe you don't care. You might want to have something which attaches, you know, where you can label the end and label the beginning again, so to speak. I mean, naively, what, what you're doing here, one of the problems here, though, is that this is basically a bunch of graphics. But I suppose what you're effectively doing is if, if we said, uh, what could we do? We, we, I mean, just to make a naive thing, we could just make, I, I just want to make a sample of this for one second. Let me just see whether this is possible. Um, if we do a graphics row, does a graphics row, does, do you know if a graphics row will, um, uh, so let's say we make a graphics row of table of, um, graphics of disk, for example. Um, uh, somebody should adjust their microphone. Well, that wasn't enough. That did not work well, because that obviously doesn't. OK, so row of that. Um, OK, so let's just look here. That's an interesting issue. We either get to have, um, so let's say image size to 40 or something. Okay, so that works fine and it even bizarrely indents a bit. So what we would do be doing here is we'd be saying something like graphics of table of, I mean, I'm just gonna make a naive case because I wanna see what it works here. Um, line, um, so let's say line from, uh, uh, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to make several lines stacked on top of each other. So I want the x coordinate zero, y coordinate y, one y, uh, table that y, zero, four, for example. And then that will make that. And then I want to say that thing, uh, image size goes to, let's say, 50. Okay, let's say, actually, let's say image size goes to 30. And now my idea would be to take those guys and say, make a table of um, those guys, let's say 50 of them. Um, yeah, let's just take this. Uh, and then, then I can say row of that and see what it does. Okay, this is looking promising. So now the only issue is that those have gaps between them. And the question is, how do we get rid of the gaps, right? So, so this is doing the right thing. Jacob, you can see what, what's mm -hmm. happening here, right? Yeah. Um, so the only issue is, how do we get rid of the gaps? And I'm guessing that there's an option in row to determine that. Or maybe, oh, it might be a graphics padding issue. Um, 
It's probably a graphics padding issue. There's mm. probably a way to specify in graphics that you want zero padding. Um, yeah, image padding. Who knows? There's some detail there. Um, but I think this is going to work. So if we do it this way, now the only problem is that the selection then is going to have a very weird selection behavior. Am I making sense? But this would be the automatic representation of... I would think so. Because of a quantum it, circuit. Yeah. it can get quite large. I, I was wondering whether we can have some sort of a scrolling bar. It's a window with a scrolling bar and it allows you to see if it's too large, you can move it. You mean horizontally? Horizontally, yes. Well, we can do that. I mean, that will happen naturally. Hey, somebody needs to adjust their microphone. Do they hear any bunch of background noise? The um, background noise, please adjust something. Um, okay. Well, okay, fine. So we could try, okay, look, maybe what we could try doing is assembling this as graphics objects, and then if we end up splitting it apart and having them be in a row, then so be it. But otherwise, we could just have it go off the page, I suppose. The only problem is I think the graphics will naturally resize it. Uh, okay, so long as the, um, uh, you know, so long as the image size is adjusted so that it has a certain, you know, because otherwise it's going to adjust itself to just squash in to fit the width. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and there may be some other tricky things like those fonts may have to be adjusted with their uh, font size to be dependent on the graphic size and so on. If we want to use those fonts as essentially visual, uh, you know, indicators rather than as actual letters of a certain size, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so still, it would be nice to have some ideas here. All right, but let's talk about the state representation. So you're saying that, I mean, your version of the state representation right now is essentially this quantum plot. The quantum plot is a way of showing the states, is it not? Right. And Which makes it unwieldy when you have large states. Yes. I mean, does anybody care about, uh, about a visual representation for large states? Or, I mean, it is nice to be able to see where the, you know, where the amplitude is concentrated. Um, but maybe there's a different way to do that that doesn't involve, you know, essentially making a histogram. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly with a with a, uh, you know, binary product state, for example, you could imagine an array plot. But with a, you know, if you have a, a six-way product state, that's not going to work. Right. Okay. So let's. So we don't know how we're going to represent um, quantum discrete state, although. Yeah. I mean, you know, to me, one of the most one of the naive things would be what is the what is the uh the basis state with the most amplitude in it? I mean, a lot of times in practice, that's what people are gonna care about. In other words, essentially the ranked list of most popular you know, basis state follow going onward. I mean, like if you're doing chemistry or something, that's probably what you care about. Okay. What is the thing usually, you know, um, now, you know, in some cases, the thing may be very widely, uh, you know, widely distributed, but in other cases, it's going to be heavily concentrated. We are listening to somebody typing. Could you please adjust? Um, okay, we, we better go on and take a look through some of these other things here. But But I think, I mean, and, and by the way, I think what you've done here, Jacob, of having a gray background is a, is a reasonable idea. I mean, we need some characteristic background color. I mean, it would be good to have some spooky quantum color for this, <laughs> you know, like light purple or something. I don't know. Um, it just, just in order to theme it in some way so it doesn't look like. Um, and I think what we're going to end up with, I mean, it would be interesting. It is surprisingly complicated to draw this diagram for the... Um, uh, for the sorting network. It would be very cool if the same, yeah, maybe it doesn't make sense. I'm just wondering whether there's a, a thing where one could basically use the same uh, graphics sort of technology. If there's a way of representing, I mean, this thing, 
Okay, how do we represent? If we were going to represent a sorting network, which by the way is presumably a valid, I mean, is, is there a valid quantum operation that corresponds to, it's a swap operation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So how do you draw a swap operation? So uh, I think I was saying earlier, you can draw just um, X's connecting the two wires um, with a, like a line between them. Um, or you could just draw three C knots. Okay, wait a second. What, 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 three C knots? Where's the third one in the middle? Uh, so you could have C knot uh, acting on, like from the first going down to the second, and then C knot from the second going up to the first, and then a C knot going from the first down to the second. That's equivalent to a swap operation. But if you want to have a representation for the swap on its own, then that's just an X on the first one, an X on the second one, and a line connecting them. Okay, fine. So it's just this thing with a bunch of X's at the ends. Right. By the way, somebody uh, named Tangled Spaces from uh, the live stream has is asking the question, what about phase? Um, and they're right. Uh, um, it, the thing I was saying about what thing has the largest amplitude is kind of, I mean, that, that's, that's not telling us anything about the phase. And, and in fact, this diagram is not telling us anything about the phase either, is it? Right. So in the beginning, uh, we had talked about uh, some uh, way to do that, um, some way to talk about its uh, complex uh, amplitudes and, and phases, um, but we hadn't really uh, ended up concluding anything. Uh, well, okay, so here's a naive idea, okay, that might be interesting. I mean, I'm sure, you know, perhaps there's other people who've thought about this, but, you know, one naive idea would be to draw essentially a polar diagram in which, okay, so here's a crazy idea for you. Okay, so so let's let's see. This is, this is circuits. This is graphics of circuits. Um, and now we also have graphics of states. Um, okay, crazy idea is draw a polar diagram where every um, state, every basis state is a point in the polar diagram and is labeled with its name. So, so let's draw a, let's see, list polar plot is basically what we're doing. And the list polar plot would have, I don't even remember how this works. Is it R theta? Presumably it's R theta. So it will be a random real 10 random real uh, zero to two pi, right? And I want to do, um, let's make a bunch of those. Um, can we join them to the origin, do you think? Anybody know? Magnificent, but what happens if we say, is there a way of joining these to the origin? That's probably gonna join them each to themselves, yes. Okay, so that maybe is a... Um, so the problem is if they all have the exact same phase, namely zero phase or something like that, then they're all gonna overlap. But they're not if they have different amplitudes. They all have the same amplitude, you're right. If they all have mm -hmm. the same amplitude and phase, then you're toast. But right. in, by the way, let me just see, is there a way of joining? Does anybody know? Can somebody look this up? Is there a way of joining these to the origin? Polar axis origin. It's kind of silly, actually. We should have that. Um, is Sushma here? Yes, I'm here. Could you make that suggestion mm -hmm. to Brett? Yes, I will. I don't, I mean, unless we have it and I just don't know. Yeah, I am looking at the documentation, but if I don't find anything, I will let him know. Okay. Um, okay, but in any case, my proposal here, so, so we can do this in, um, what is the thing? Polar to rectangular, what is it? From polar coordinates, good. Okay, so from polar coordinates of this thing, um, Um, let's say, so what I'm proposing is, uh, just to be explicit here, um, actually, let me do this. Uh, um, um, 
um, um, um, like this. I want the line from zero to, uh, so let's say we make a gray line from zero to that, and then we make a black piece of text at, um, and let's say, I don't know who knows what it is, cat random, um, let's say random uh, integer um, one, three, um, and then I want that at position, at the same position as the other thing, PP. Um, so then this is, let's see, am I getting this wrong? Um, I'm not sure the line construction is correct. Don't you have to map? to have different lines? No, I'm, I'm going to do that because I'm going to make this whole thing is going to be a table and then the whole thing is going to be graphics. What am I doing wrong here? Valuation points. Oh, oh, polar coordinates from polar coordinates is R comma theta. What am I doing wrong here? R theta, yes? What is wrong there? How can it say 5.69? How could there be a 5.69 in a thing that says that? Wait, wait, 5.69 is not smaller than two pi. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is, I'm sorry, it is smaller than two pi. So what is it complaining about? It's not a valid set of Spherical or hyperspherical points? Okay, hold on. What is going on here? That, and we say from polar coordinates. Okay, I am totally confused. What is wrong with that? Interesting. Oh. Wait a minute, minus pi to pi. That's kind of stupid. Why does it do that? Uh, yes, yes, Why I remember. Why does it do that? That's yes. stupid. Mm -hmm. Is there a good reason for that or is it just dumb? Um, no, I remember discussing this, whether we should allow any angle and I we had different we opinions. Angle. I can't see why we wouldn't want to allow any angle. Right. If we're not allowing any angle, the very least the message here right. should not be as obscure as this. It should actually say is not in the range minus pi to pi. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can we, who is this mm -hmm. a pi function? Uh, yes. Could we complain to him, please? Yes, I, I will. Okay. Okay. This is not totally stupid what this did here. Do you agree? I mean, uh, it's a little, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I think that I like the idea. Uh, I think that there's some refining that needs to be done. Definitely. Right. But I mean, so this is then showing the amplitude and phase. And if they were all on the real line, you would basically see something which just had the ranking of, you know, which just had each one of these. It would say, you know, zero, 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 one, zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ranked on the real line. Am I making sense? But even in this picture, some of the cats are so close to each other that they you can't see one from the other. That's correct, but that's life. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no way, there's no way we're going to be able to have this be perfect. The issue is, I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen. I mean, you know, what do people do in representing quantum states? Um, I think uh, uh, we use matrix plot to do that from uh, the density matrix. Yeah, I understand, but that's. But how do you represent phase there? Yeah, it's difficult to read from there because uh, if it has uh, of di of diagonal uh, in, uh, numbers, then we 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 know that there are uh, um, phases. But right, but are you doing the phases with color coding? The argument of the complex number with the color code or something? I don't think so. Well, tentatively, I consider this not totally stupid. And, and maybe we can have multiple, I mean, uh, yes. Okay, 
I mean, I don't know what this does for a density matrix, though. This doesn't really generalize to a density matrix, does it? No. I mean, it's sounding to me like we're going to wind up needing multiple representations of this. And, okay, this one is, is one possible thing. But I, I really, and I think it would be a useful one to at least have code to support this, just so we can play around with it and see whether it's reasonable. Okay, in the minus 15 minutes that we have, and, and Eric if, if, um, uh, should push back the next thing by another 15 minutes, because in fact, I'm gonna be able to go past, I'm gonna be able to go 30 minutes late uh, on this next meeting. Um, let him know. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's let's look at your other things here. So the quantum half adder. Okay, that's dandy. Again, so what is the difference in a quantum operation and this quantum discrete state first argument? Remind me of that. So we decided um, we we had a whole like hour long discussion about this. How uh, you can either have the regular state uh, arguments like we have in the first three examples uh, right there, or you could have product or uh, the trace or oh right right because these are essentially making outer products of things. They're they're combining sort of subspaces to make the whole thing. It's not right. They're combinators. Yeah. What are you saying? Are they combinators would mean well in a in yeah anyway never mind doesn't matter but okay there did you mean that in a useful technical sense no okay fine um sorry <laughs> you, might, you might have been meaning something very interesting but which I didn't understand but okay fine um because I don't know any relationship between combinators and all this stuff um okay so it is a way of essentially. Okay, fine. That all makes sense. Okay, so here, quantum discrete operation applying. So let me ask this question. In the neural net framework, these are represented by net ports in various ways. I think. I think the analog of the quantum entity here is a net port. You know anything okay. about the... the um, now, that is not necessarily a very helpful statement, but let's take a look here. Um, okay. Ay, 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 ay. Ay, 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 ay. So that is a, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, hmm. No, that's not particularly useful. So it's a labeling of I mean, essentially, it's a way of labeling uh, input and output that are supposed to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. It is it is the direct analog of net port, but it does not appear to be syntactically similar to net port. I think that the difference is that you can't have different input and outputs in the quantum case. What do you mean by different? Oh, oh, you mean I see that every every port has to be both an input port and an output port. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So that does make it somewhat different. Okay. Um, and actually, these this these gate uh, constructions that I have right here. Um, remember before we had the whole uh, wire goes to the dimension and all, all that crazy stuff. Yep. Now um, that's all out of there. I still you still have the capability of doing that. For instance, if you wanted to um, put in like the quantum discrete operation of Pauli X gate on some wire one, and then you wanted to say, cute at dimension goes to five, then it would generate the Pauli X operator um, in uh, like a first spin five over two system. Okay. Um, and you could even do power goes to three. So then it would do, you know, the th like the th three Pauli X operations consecutively um, in that, you know, five-dimensional space. Wait a minute. What, what, where's the power goes to three thing going? So if you, uh, it's it's an optional, uh, it's an option. For what? So if you say quantum discrete operation. Yeah. Um, and then you put uh, Pauli X gate 
Yeah, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. So you say quantum discrete operation. Okay. Uh, and then your first argument is Pauli X gate. Pauli X second... gate, like that. Mm -hmm. And then your second one is the wire. By the way, we can't call one thing Toffoli, even though my friend Tom Toffoli, you know, uh, we can't, and, and then we call this Pauli X gate. We either got to call it Toffoli gate. Okay, I can, I can change X all that. Or, uh, what, what should we do? Should we call it Pauli X or should we call it Pauli X gate? Is there anything that isn't a gate that's the first argument of a quantum discrete operation? They're all gates. But so when I was should, saying Pauli yeah. X earlier, you uh, wanted me to put gate because uh, you thought that it could be misconstrued and used in a non-quantum computing context. Yes. Fair enough. Then we should we should uh, put gate uh, for everything. You know, affix gate to my friend Tom Toffoli. Okay. Um, so if you put wire like like W right there, um, and then after that you just put in in quotations Q to dimension, and then an arrow five. Yep. Them. And then you wanted to say um, in, yeah, so that creates something that is a uh, Pauli X operator in this five dimensional space. So acting okay. on like, spin five over two systems. Yep. So I just okay. have options for that and power, which is way, way simpler than the previous construction. Fine. But if I apply this to a spin half system, it's just going to uh, complain or what? Uh, you can try it. Okay. So the way I would do that is I would say, apply that, how do I apply one of these operations? Let you just um, put the quantum state um, in your square brackets after that operation, um, but you need to be acting on the same qubit. So if you put that on. Okay, uh, let's, let's do qubit one and let's do this and then say D1 here. So what it does is my framework, it, it when you act on, uh, so it immediately, when you acted on a quantum state, um, it'll correct the dimension to the dimension of that wire um, in your state, um, if necessary. And it just does that silently? Yep. Um, I can put right in a message for that. No, but is it the right thing to do or not? I don't really understand what that is. I mean, in other words, if I've got a spin five halves system and I operate on it, no, I have a spin five halves operator which happens to only have a poor little electron to operate on. What does it, I don't really understand how that works. So the, the point is that it doesn't work, but that right now I'm like automatically uh, correcting for that. And I guess I should okay. spit out an error message that says- I think you should uh, have some message. Okay. Um, okay, let, let's look quickly through these other things. Right. And then... So the half adder just shows that you can, uh, you know, take quantum superpositions and do what, you know, classical, Half adder does with them, um, and then quantum teleportation is oh, actually wait, 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 wait. quantum partial trace. So uh, I think I've shown that one before, um, and that's actually there's there's a uh, way to do that um, in the quantum discrete state. Um, you can trace out subsystems like that, uh, but basically you take a quantum state that has uh, you know n substates in it. Yeah, and they, yeah, right. I want to get rid of these ones. So just throw out right. all so, my... So I wonder whether, I mean, depending on whether we want to have so many functions or whether we want to just have quantum discrete state and then something like projection arrow, something like this mm -hmm. would be another possibility. Okay. I don't know if that's the right way to do it. I mean, that would be, but is that equivalent? It is purely... What you're doing is simply projecting into that subspace. Is that not correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. So, I mean, what we would naively do is we would do that, and then we would say state vector, for example, and that would be equivalent to what you have down below, which seems pretty reasonable, actually. Mm -hmm. Something like this. That definitely seems reasonable. Okay. Um, okay, now what is the difference? The quantum circuit here is yet different. So a quantum circuit is a combination, is a sequence of quantum discrete operations. Right, and there's also the ability to, um, I, th I think we uh, bit over this before as well, um, you can uh, actually simplify the quantum circuit. Um, there's different arguments you can have that um, 
you know, perform different simplifications um, to get rid of like, like algebraic identities and things like that. Um, but we probably don't have time to go into that again right now. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Quantum teleportation. Uh, so this is the most interesting example here. Um, so basically, uh, you have these two people. Um, they each start out with states. Um, the interesting one is Alice. She has this non-trivial state. Right. Um, and Ancilla and, is interesting just because it's not a name I've usually seen used in these. Um... Yeah. And so in quantum computing, Ancillas are, uh, that's like the way you talk about these extra uh, bits oh, okay. of for your computations. Okay, fine. Is, are um, people naming their children that yet? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but yeah. you know, Bob has this uh, you know, trivial basis state, and Alice has a state. Um, it's in some superposition, and Bob um, wants Bob and Alice want to transport Alice's state to Bob. Um, uh, you know, in this quantum fashion, so Alice yep. could really have whatever state she wants and do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. Okay. Basically, so this quantum circuit. It's this is just a demonstration that here. Um, you can deterministically, using classical information, after the quantum circuit, um, like included in the quantum circuit, uh, transfer a quantum state with unknown amplitude and phase. Okay, so are we able to show that symbolically? Is our quantum circuit here? What is this quantum discrete conditional operation? What is that? So uh, that's something that, based on the outcome of a measurement, um, it performs certain quantum operations. Ugh. Okay, and where is the measurement here? Is that where's the measurement happening in this in this quantum circuit? Is the measurement being represented or not? Yep, the yeah, measurement the is the M. Measurement. The oh, measurement that's is a horrifying business. Okay. Yeah, um, but you need the classical operations. Um, uh, you saw the the double wires in those diagrams we're looking at online. Um, you can't yeah. really do quantum computing without them. By the way, what on earth is this error message? I have not seen that. No, I'm sure you haven't. I mean, this is this is what's causing these weird things that I've just been reporting. Um, uh, can somebody ask Roger to take a look at this? This is obviously the thing that's been messing up my installations for the last day or so, and it probably has to do with um, uh, um, it probably has to do with installing some weird experimental thing. Um, Okay. Yeah. So, okay, but but explain to me. So the interesting yeah. part here is that the the laws of quantum mechanics tell you that you cannot copy a quantum state. So you can't just right. you know create a, a copy of Alice's state and give that to Bob as well. So what's happening here is you're using these reversible quantum operations uh, in conjunction with measurements and classical operations conditioned on those measurements to deterministically transport Alice's state to Bob. Yep. Um, and no matter what the operations are that you get out, I mean, the, uh, the result is of your quantum measurement, you can always act with a specific classical operation on that that'll give you exactly what the quantum state was without even knowing what it was. Yep, yep, yep. No, I, I know this. I know this claim. Right. So, so walk me through a couple of things here. So first of all, can we verify this symbolically or are we only... In other words, if I put symbolic variables in here, will, will I get reasonable results or will I not? So the get... symbolic variables work through everything up until the measurement, um, because for measurements, you need specific probabilities. Um, you can't really do a measurement on symbolic amplitudes. Let's think about that. Even in our framework for representing probabilities symbolically? Uh, so maybe there is a way to do it. Um, but I could not think of an easy way to do it. So but everything else in the circuit should work symbolically. Well, that's great. But let's let's try and nail this particular thing. So what you're saying is that you are trying to, yeah, this really should work using our symbolic probability stuff. So, I mean, in other words, there's this notion of probability. And what you're saying is you're slicing off pieces of this you know, with certain probabilities, you're doing this, With you're doing, okay, so in this case here, you're saying, if this thing is equal to that, then give this, etc. if I'm not mistaken. Right. Okay, so I think you can do that with, 
I think you can do that with this probability function. In other words, right, because so it I'm has it has some kind of conditioned, there's a mechanism for conditioning this on that and so on. I, I will definitely look into that. Okay, but I don't actually understand what this is doing here. So what is what are the X, Y, and Z here? Oh, X, Y, and Z are actual, I see, that's do this, apply this gate if, and and where, I'm now confused. So if, hash sign. So that's if your measurement result um, is that you get your first eigenvalue for, uh, you know, qubit, like the first qubit you measured and the first eigenvalue for the, the second qubit you measured, then perform a Y gate uh, yeah, I mean, on. I have to say, just in terms of the representation of this, for example, you know, presumably the measurement is represented as, you know, Y a zero is in state one. Is that right? But you can look at measurements on their own. Um, measurements can be uh, utilized outside of the circuit framework here as well. Okay, so what does re measurement return? So uh, you can, so if you just like press M or like uh, type in M and enter, you'll see uh, you just get that. But if you were instead to have as, as a second argument, um, a quantum state that you wanted to measure. So if you put that and then after that first argument, you put S, Okay. What on earth is all of that? Okay, is that is that just showing me? Wait a minute, that's just showing me the picture here. No, what on earth is that showing me? Um. Okay, what what's inside this thing? Uh, that so that's your measurement result, and if you wanted to, now if you put, um. You can look at properties of that. So if you put square brackets and then uh, probability distribution, or like, I think it's probability distribution. Okay. So that gives you the different states that you could, uh, these are the uh, state vectors you could have ended up in and the probabilities. Okay. Wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. If they are state vectors, why are they not represented? I mean, just having, I mean, what are those density matrices, or what? What are those things? Those are the state vectors, not the quantum discrete states. Those are the state vectors. I see. I see. So um, those are the. If you, if you said instead of probability distribution, if you said collapse, then it would create a quantum state out of those probabilities. That seems like a rather unfortunate word. I mean, it should be like collapsed state or something like that. Okay. Is that a right? I mean, when we say collapsed state. I guess that's the right thing. I hate this stuff. I don't really believe in it. Anyway, but never mind that. The, um, but I thought this was the best way to, uh, so you save all the measurement information and then you can decide which, like what type of thing you want out of no, it. No, I like it. I like it. But I, I think, I mean, this is, and the operation, we can't represent this as quantum discrete operation, just saying, I mean, we're sure we can't make measurement be one of these operations. I'm absolutely sure. They're fundamentally different. Well, I understand that, but they're returning, these are returning quantum discrete states, whereas this is returning, see, this is returning, what is the, what is the head of that thing? Okay, so it's returning itself there. Because really what that's doing, so a quantum discrete op, okay, quantum discrete state acted on by a quantum operation. See, what's a little bit funky here is that normally you have a quantum discrete state which can be acted on by a quantum discrete operation, right? Mm -hmm. Here, you're saying you have a quantum discrete measurement which returns a quantum discrete measurement rather than a quantum discrete measured state or something. Okay, I can I can definitely change that. Well, but I mean, what, what's the right way to think about this? But, I mean, so the problem is, uh, if you say returning a quantum measured state, then yeah. that means you've already collapsed it down, um, which is not necessarily correct because you could want to get out the probabilities of certain things happening, like uh, like we have right here. So I'm sorry, walk me through that again for a second. Um, so the measurement. You know, you could 
for your calculations, um, when you're you know, observing things or whatever, you could want to have the information about the probabilities with which things occurred. Um, and this is the exact probabilities, um, not just, you know, running this a couple hundred times and getting, you know, approximate. Oh, I understand. I understand. But I mean, so wait a second. So the, the issue that I'm making here is I understand that I, I don't understand quite why you're making, I mean, you say quantum discrete operation, normally those are information preserving quantum operations, like a, a you know, a Hadamard gate or whatever. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is it so horrendous? So each one of those quantum discrete operations maps a quantum discrete state. Uh, so quantum measurement is, um, you know, in the, in the simplest case, um, like it is a projection, which is not, right. um, it, which is not reversible. It's sure, not I understand that. I understand that. But, but the thing that you get out is, yeah. Walk me through though. This is saying these complete state vectors have these particular probabilities. Right. Whereas previously, we had said that these state vectors have up here, for example, I see. Yeah, right. That's right. Oh my gosh. This design stuff always forces one to actually understand what's going on with, okay. So see what's a little weird here is that in the other case, we've got a state vector for a quantum discrete state. We've got a particular state vector represented by one of these sparse arrays. So now we've got a collection of possible state vectors corresponding to the sort of eigenstates of the measurement or some whatever one wants mm -hmm. to say that are um, that have assigned, by the way, I would not call it probability distribution. It is not a probability distribution. Okay. It's probabilities, put plural. Okay. Right? Or, or, or something, or state probabilities, or something like that, because probability distribution, I, I think, well, okay, so we're, does anybody know a cate the categorical distribution in the probability framework? This thing is really a, th actually, the correct thing for this re to return would be some kind of categorical distribution. Does that make sense to you? Because, because what it's doing is, just like we have normal distribution or we have Poisson distribution, for example. Okay, so normally what's really nice is that we can say Poisson distribution, um, let's say we could say Poisson distribution of six, and then we can say PDF of Poisson distribution of six comma X, right? What the heck? Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. What on earth is that? What is that thing? Uh, that? I can't see that. Well, I don't know what it is, but it must be something that's come up from your, oh, we've probably set you, you were using single letter variable names and that's what it was. Okay, there we go. That's a more reasonable plus on PDF. Okay, X was just set to something in this session. Right. Right. Okay, but my point is that if you are able to return, this is very cute. If you're able to return an actual probability distribution, right? You can go to town using all the standard probability computation stuff. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So and then there is a empirical distribution that I think we can use here. Okay, fine. That's that's I was I was forgetting the name. Um Right. So empirical distribution is yeah that's reasonable enough where data values occur with these weights right get what i'm saying so in fact where data value d so it's it's the flip around of these things right mm -hmm. um i don't think this is quite right i think it has to be categorical distribution because these these are data values, which are real valued things, whereas these are whole big matrix thingies. Get what okay. I'm saying? Um, and I think there's something that is coming that is called categorical distribution. Uh, 
Um, um, maybe we can try to find that out. Let's see, who did I hear about that from? The neural network team yes. needs that. It, it, it was in ML meeting. I will check with Etienne what's the status of that. Okay. Okay, fine, because that's going to be needed here. Um, okay, so one last go around of this quantum measurement thing. So what you're saying is, um, uh, okay, somebody is asking from our live stream, Swishka is asking, why are there just three states? Shouldn't it be a power of two? Uh, what is the answer to that? Is this measuring a a um, spin one object or what? This particular thing here where we did um, line 95. What was line 95? What is S here? It's a product state of those three things. What What's the answer to why there are only three, why, why there are three outcomes here? Jacob? Perhaps those are the only ones which are not zero. No, there's one that's zero here. Did we lose Jacob? Any sign of Jacob? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Did, yeah did so, uh, oh. sorry, I just had mute on for a second. Um, so even, even if you're dealing with qubits, um, you, you have powers of two, uh, you could end up with states when you project into on, onto a certain uh, basis, you could end up with certain ones of your states going to the same thing. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. I understand. But so the labeling of these states by these sparse arrays. So certain, yeah. Go ahead. Certain uh, states being you broke up the hello. Yeah, the same thing. What? Hello? Yep, you, you just broke up. Um, could you say again? So basically, uh, by virtue of the state uh, that we had. Um, we can't hear you. When you perform these projections. Hello? We we can't hear you properly. You keep on breaking up. Uh, certain probably hear me. Only can you hear just. me? Yep, can now. So basically, the quantum states when you when you project them, they end up in the same thing. Yeah. Okay, I get that. All right. Fine. Okay. So again, quantum measurement, quantum discrete measurement. What you're saying is you need to get out from that. Gosh, I mean, you've got to basically say quantum discrete measured state, don't you? I mean, I don't really see a way to get around that. Okay. Am I, I'm, anybody got any other suggestions? I mean, the other possibility, I suppose, the contents of a quantum measured discrete measured state, What is what are its contents and how do they compare to a quantum discrete state? Or could we do something where we basically say in here, you know, where we where we have also a quantum discrete state, and we just have an indication of whether it's a pure state or a, or a mixed state. No, a, a measured state, a, a measured state can be represented as a mixed state. Is that true? Uh, any pure state can be represented as a mixed state. No, no, but a measured, after a measurement, you have a mixed state, correct? Uh, yes. Well, you will have a pure state. It's just that you have a probability, a distribution of different ones. So if you perform the measurement and you forego all, or you, you uh, completely lose all information about what the measurement outcome was, then you end up in a, in a mixture. Yeah, I understand. Okay, but, but, but let's... Uh, okay, but... That, actually. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem with giving the distribution of... of possible probabilities and their corresponding states. Well, that's what this is here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I mean, a, a true measurement will be choosing one of those. Which is the collapse. The collapse, yeah. And the collapse is 
inherently what happens when you have measurement inside of the quantum circuit. Wait a second. When, when you say collapse, how is it deciding which of those to choose? With some random probability. Um, oh, gosh. Yes. That the, is a horrible name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would be one of our random something. Okay. That, that takes a probability and returns. I think that's what I'm actually using. I'm using random choice. Uh, right. Yeah, well, so is this, um, can you feed that, that um, uh, association to random choice? Is it the right I way think, around? I think so some on? version of that to random choice. Yeah, but I wonder whether it's the same way around. Um, it is, may not be. Does random choice accept associations? Uh, I think that I just uh, manipulate it such that I get the weights and the... Okay, but we should probably have something that's consistent because we have a notion of weighted data. So maybe we should return. I mean, I think the thing we have to return... You know, look. If what we fundamentally return is a categorical distribution, then all of these operations will just work on it. Right, random variant will work, random choice, whatever it is, will work on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. What other information, other than these probabilities, what other information comes out of a quantum measurement? Or is that it? That's it. Well, do you want to have the measured value and the final state? Yes, so that in the um, the quantum circuit, uh, you have actually. I think that there's an option for for getting the the value as well. I forgot what it is, um, but um, in the quantum uh, circuit, you actually implicitly need to know which value is measured, um, and it does that for you. Yeah. Okay, but so that means we can't just return some categorical distribution. We have to return a whole structure that represents the result of a measurement. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is, I mean, it is some kind of quantum discrete measured state. Is that, is that the right name for it? I mean, in, in what on earth does it mean? Okay. So this is now showing my, I mean, what is the, what is the correct version of quantum non discrete measured state? That is, you just found the position of the particle in the box or something. There is a notion of a quantum measured state that is with respect, you know, with delta function, with some basis that's some delta function or something. Is that right? right. Yeah. And, and in what sense, how does that, um, uh, you know, how does that, um, um, how does that relate to what we're doing here? By the way, somebody on the live stream points out this should be random variant and they're absolutely correct. Um, go ahead. I, th yeah. I think I, I would return a pair here, which is the, the measured value and the new state without needing. So the, the, the output of this random something would be a pair, a bit like arc, mean, and this sort of thing. Wait a minute. Arg min doesn't return a pair. Arg min returns one thing. You mean minimize or something returns a pair? Uh, yes, yes. I don't remember which one it is. Right, but, but so what are you actually proposing here? You're proposing that quantum... Imagine some sort of random measure that takes the either the 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 state and the operator or the probability distribution, and then it returns a pair, which is the measured value and the state, the new state of the system. I'm not but it, it, it has to have the word random somewhere. But we don't want, I mean, this random variate thing is a funky, you know, tentacle here, because that's really just for show, the random variate thing. What we really want to be doing is representing the whole probability distribution, which we can then do other operations on, as, as in this picture. Okay. Um, listen, what else did we need to achieve in this, in this meeting? I, we still have m more stuff to go over, but... but um, uh, what, I think that's enough to work on for now. Okay. Um, all right. Well, 
Uh, fine. So we've so we've got a, a path forward on the graphics for circuits. We don't have a particular path forward on the graphics for states. So for now, we'll, I guess we have to keep just returning them as these explicit expressions. Um, uh, let me see. Um, we got a lot of these different accessors. I think it's time to start writing documentation pages for our main functions. Okay. Okay. Um, I can start doing that. Okay. Do you know how to do it? Or the, the... Uh, no. So uh, this is going to show me. I, I will help. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, let me see. Um, I mean, you've got a bunch of other functions in here. That okay. So some of these are just testing functions. What is quantum discrete observable? Uh, so that's an object that uh, encodes the the thing that you want to uh, basically the basis you want to measure in. Um, but it can be. It doesn't have to be just a, a basis um, in that it can also be a POVM, like a projection uh, or a positive operator value measurement. Um, and the uh, observable uh, was like one way to talk about all that stuff. Well, but so that's essentially one of the arguments to quantum discrete measurement. Is that right? Uh, yes. And if you don't use that, then it just assumes that you're measuring in the identity in, in the, you know, the trivial basis. But, but wait a second, but is there any other use of quantum observable outside of the discrete measurement function? Uh, I mean, no, because all you do with observables is you, you measure them. Um, well, okay, so then, then we probably don't want to introduce a separate whole creature to represent these observables. What, what, what do we have to, can we pack the observable into the second argument of, or some argument of quantum discrete measurement? Uh, we absolutely can. Um, I was just using this at this point for, for ease um, for my own cases. Um, okay. I can definitely pack that in. Well, what would, um, what's the specification of the observable? Um, I don't 100% remember. It should be stated there. Um, so the Hermitian matrix desk. So it's a, some Hermitian matrix. Some yes. So where is that? Um, right. So if you don't put it in, then it just assumes that you have the identity. So what you're saying is that that in this quantum discrete measurement, you're asking for these two quantum entities, measure them with respect to this quantum state. Is that right? And then I, I don't quite understand. What does it mean? What does it mean to measure them? It measures them using this as some kind of basis. Is that right? Uh, so it measures so you measure the observable um, in the basis that is like implicitly given by uh, so the observable is the Hermitian matrix, really. The observable is described by the Hermitian matrix. And what are the rows and columns that the Hermitian matrix represent? Uh, they're they're basically the the bases. Okay, and where in this representation in this form, where are the bases being input? What are you measuring it with respect to? I mean, it's like spin so, up versus spin down, but where, do, where am I saying that? Right, so if you don't specify what the Hermitian matrix is, then it just automatically uses the identity. So it measures it just you know, the way that you measure in the computational basis. Right, but so it measures it, but I, I still don't understand. This quantum discrete, I see, I see. So the basis then is literally the actual rows and columns of that quantum discrete states state vector. Is right. that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the point is that you can give a Hermitian matrix that scrambles up those 
Um, how does it how does it get applied? Is it like a, a similarity transform to that state vector or something, or what? Uh, it's something like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that can perfectly well be a third argument to quantum discrete measurement. Seems to me. I mean, that mm -hmm. seems like a. So this is what what would it usually be called? What would that Hermitian matrix be called? Yeah, that could be. No, but what, what is it called in the world of, I mean, so there is an observable, but that observable. It's just the way that we talk about it is it's like the operator corresponding to the observable. It's the. I know, see, the, I see, I see, I see, I see. Right, 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 right. That is the operator that you are measuring. Mm -hmm. right? I see. And so this is, this function, this thing here is, okay, these are the, okay, so let's write this out. So these are the entities that you're measuring. These are, this is the basis, and that's the operator. Is that right? Uh, yes. Is that order of arguments right? Yes. It seems wrong to me. I mean, I, I understand it's right for what you've done, but it seems like this is like measuring, you know, when you say expectation, which, by the way, is something that will work on our categorical distribution, you are... You're saying, I mean, okay, so what this is asking, it's the expectation of an operator in a thing distributed a certain way. I mean, in a sense, the analog of this, right? If we wrote this here, what we would naively, oh my gosh, what a mess. Okay, that was a bad idea. Expectation of expo with x distributed according to distribution right okay so the analog of that in the quantum measurement case would be um you know quantum discrete measurement of i would think the operator with the entities hmm Am I getting this right? Or is this is this the right analog here? I'm not necessarily pushing this particular form, but you understand what the the question is, what's the analog? So this is an expectation. I mean, let me give the you know an actual example here. The expectation of x squared with x distributed according to a Poisson distribution. Yeah, you're right. That is that's the analog. Um well, let's walk this through for a second, because that operator is simply a Hermitian matrix, right? Uh, um, so would it be uh, this, like, would the expression, instead of being the operator, would that be the state? And then I'm you're not sure. I think, it, I think it would be the operator acting on the state, probably. I'm not sure. Jose or anybody else, do you, can you see what the answer is here? I think this is correct. So the operator is the equivalent of the expression and the state is what is defining the probability distribution. And what I'm saying, what I'm saying basis here, I should say state. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So, interesting. Does it... I mean, just for my understanding, this distributed according to thing. So when we say a state, so quantum discrete, what is the relationship between quantum discrete state and a classical distribution? Answer, one is dealing with quantum amplitudes and um, uh, um, one is um, uh, dealing with, um, um, uh, one is dealing with classical probabilities. And so to say distributed according to, what is the quantum probability analog of distributed according to? I think the amplitudes would be the, the best answer there. Fair enough. But what we're having to say here, okay, so the state encodes names of quantum entities, and this is saying entities distributed according to this uh, this quantum discrete state. Right. I, th I think the equivalent is a system is in a given state. That's the equivalent of something follows a given distribution. Yeah. Right. So you don't okay. necessarily want to measure all of the components of that system. You may only want to measure a few of the components. 
Right. Exactly. So, so, so the better, best form of this would be, the description of this would be, um, okay, so let's write the description. Measures the operator, measures operator for, you know, for the entities, for the, for the, for the entities in the state. Is that the right way to say it? Yeah. And then we can have an elided form of this in which we drop the operator at the front, which assumes it's the identity operator. Yeah, that's, that looks good to me. Okay. By the way, um, Swishka from our live stream says block sphere graphics for each qubit would be nice as well. So that that's nice, uh, and yes, we can do that for qubits. But uh, in general, we're dealing with spin d over two systems here in this package, um, and you cannot visualize um, higher dimensional systems on uh, any equivalent of a block sphere, really. Well, so wait a minute, wait a minute. A block sphere represents the a single electron spin. Is that right? Right. And so, so like you have a picture that has a bunch of things with the, the spins pointing up and down and so on, right? Uh, yeah, you've got, I mean, you have some position at some radius from the center of your sphere um, and, you know, at some, you know, angular combination, like some phi and beta. Um, that's right. like your phase and amplitude. Um, but you can't do that for spin D over two systems where D is, you know, greater than uh, one. You know, it's my, um, uh, my, one of my favorite examples of silliness in the world is, um, you know, the plaque on Pioneer, whatever it was, 10 or something, which has that representation of the hyperfine transition of hydrogen. Okay. Which, which I guess is a, a block sphere-like representation, right? Because it's got spin up, spin down. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, um, I mean, that... Yeah, so that that by the way, I mean, what a st well, okay. Let me just let me just take that. Um, I just want to put this in our states representation thing down here. I mean, that is a pretty stupid uh, in 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 the in the space of things understood by aliens. The representation of spinners by vectors is one of the m most questionable things one can imagine, in my view. But but that is the is that right? That's like the block sphere representation of these things. Uh, so not quite because uh, on a block sphere, it's not just what orientation it's spinning in, and it's also not just up or down. Um, you can have like it could be pointing in any direction um, on on the sphere, and it can also not just be at a constant radius because if you have a mixed state, then it can be at any radius. I see. I see. I see. But so so, but what is it a representation of? It's a representation of a single electron, the density matrix for a single electron. Is that right? Right. right. Okay. And you claim there is no generalization of that for mm -hmm. higher Q dits. Exactly. Why is that obvious? Uh, if you can think about a way to represent uh, all of that information, then that would be great, but uh, I mean, do we just reinvent a block sphere like thing with this? So that's for multiple qubits. That's yeah, not yeah. for uh, you know a higher dimensional system. No, no, I understand that. I understand that, but I'm saying, yeah, okay, all right, well, okay, but that is clearly another useful representation which we should be able to have for quantum discrete state, right? You can presumably we should be able to say block blocks block sphere graphics. Mm -hmm. Is that reasonable? Yeah. And then that will work for a single state so long as it's been a half mm -hmm. w with a density matrix and so on. Right. Um, all right. Listen, I think we are converging here. I think we're actually getting to the end of this whole design discussion. Um, I'm pretty happy with what we're seeing here. And um, uh, 
this is going to be pretty nice. I mean, being able to get these categorical distributions out that you can then apply other operations to and random variates and so on, that's going to be nice. We don't have to worry about... Um, I don't think this quantum plot thing is particularly useful. Okay. I think that, that um, we may want various accessors that represent things in different ways, like this block sphere, like like some you know polar plot or something of these. And I think that's what we should concentrate on is taking the, um, I mean, this is basically taking the quantum discrete state and you know, just one of the accessors for it should represent it. There should be various accessors that represent it in various graphical forms. That sounds good. The, uh, okay. Um, so, I, I, okay, to, to, end our, to end our meeting here, we have a nice quote from the live stream from Michael Hale. Uh, your quantum stuff, he says, helps, helps him understand things, but then onward to games with general AI, genetically engineered exotic pets, and molecular design. <laughs> so those are our, so I don't know, the, 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 um, <laughs> The molecular design is probably closely connected. The um, uh, uh, genetically engineered exotic pets with quantum with quantum microtubules in their brains, no doubt, um, mm -hmm. gets. Actually, I, I just for one second here, I just want to ask the question: the quantum neural net. Do we have any idea what that is yet? So, uh, I did some more research uh, into that, and uh, it seems like uh, they're there's really no good way yet um, in the literature to do back propagation um, on in a quantum neural network. Uh, you can do things like a quantum hop field network, like a you know a single uh, layer, like completely associated memory system. Um, but I mean, if we want to do research on our own, I can try to you know look into it about how to do. You know, well, let's just think, okay, just for one second, just because we're on a roll here, let's just think about this just for a second. Okay, so so what you're saying is, I mean, the, the sort of the Hopfield network thing is just a matrix that just says, take this set of weights and apply a matrix to them, and then do that repeatedly. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, so apply a matrix to a bunch of weights is something that, so long as that matrix is unitary, kind of mm -hmm. happens rather naturally in these quantum systems. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. So the problem is, you know, the brain is not going to, I mean, it's very tough to have an attractor, which is what you typically need in a neural network when you have a, quant a unitary transformation going on all the time. If I'm not, I mean, so you have to project. At some point you have to do a projection because otherwise you're never going to have an attractor because it's a, you know, it's preserving, well, okay, so th this is like, um, you know, from a dynamics point of view, it's like the, um, uh, there, the, there are these, uh, the Henon Heil system, I think is an example of this, these two to two maps that are volume preserving. Okay, those are, those are things which will be like these unitary transformations that preserve volume and don't, don't have, um, uh, you know, I mean, normally in a neural net, it's highly r irreversible. It's going from a large number of input states, you know, here are all possible images, but you have to simply decide, are they cats or dogs, right? Mm -hmm. and, and clearly that's not what's happening in the quantum case. In the quantum case, it's preserving all the information until the very moment of measurement. Right. Right? Okay, so the issue then is, how do you, I mean, how do you back propagate from a measurement? And that seems the question tough. that nobody in the literature has an answer to at this well, point. Well, let's, let's think about that just for a second before I go off and, and um, okay. How would we think about back propagating from a measurement? So, so, in a sense, the measurement, I mean, given a certain amplitude at the end, yeah, I don't see why that's actually so hard because when a measurement happens, it's projecting, you know, you take the amplitude and you project it in various ways and you get the probabilities for the measurement. What you need is something where, like, like let's say you're, you're getting a cats versus dogs neural net. 
let's think for a second. Well, it doesn't seem so impossible to me because there's some precursor to that measurement. No, I'm not sure. Um, this you, but, but, the attractors reminds me of this older question of whether there is chaos in quantum mechanics and what's the quantum version of a chaotic system in classical mechanics. Right. So, I mean, what happened in the quantum chaos business? What did happen? I mean, people like like our friend Michael Berry did all of those things with, with uh, you know, solving the Schrodinger equation in a stadium and stuff like this. Right? This mm -hmm. is where we need Michael Trott because he knows the stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but I think what happened in that case... Yeah, it was it was very different. I mean, it ended up being sort of chaos with respect to um, solution to the, the you know eigenvalues of the Schrodinger equation, rather than dynamical chaos. I think, even though I mean, in the in those billiard systems, right, the classical, you know, you have billiards bouncing around a stadium, right, mm -hmm. and what happened was there were certain caustics, effectively, so, which corresponded to the classical paths, and then the rest of the sort of quantum stuff was filled in around that. But I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well. All right. So that's the nub of the problem. Then is is how to do, how to think about, uh, how to think about backpropagation. I mean, because what you ultimately want to be able to do is, I see, you want to be able to adjust the weights in the unitary matrix, which is, by the way, a weird operation in its own right. Because how do you do? How do you even imagine? I mean. You don't imagine that you can do that quantum mechanically, do you? You imagine that that has to be something, you know, changing the unitary matrix. You get what I'm saying? I mean, it's the code versus data thing. You're trying to change the, essentially the, you know, the circuit as you have it right now is a fixed circuit, right? It's not like something where you are, where you can rewrite the program so to speak. I mean, this is the analog, obviously, of Boolean functions as compared to Turing machines. Mm -hmm. And I suppose then there's the whole quantum cellular automaton thing, which has never really seemed to me to get very far. I mean, it's just you have, yeah. I mean, that's by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, that is something we should understand since we are in that business. Okay, given a Boolean function, what is the, you know, some very small subset of Boolean functions can be thought of as quantum, quantum compatible Boolean functions. Yes. Those are the reversible Boolean functions. Yeah. And so if I just give you an arbitrary Boolean function, so if I say, you know, given a Boolean function, um, and I've got to go here, but, but um, given, given a Boolean function, some small subset are reversible, right? Um, and we can enumerate, you know, some particular numbered Boolean function is going to be reversible. How do I take that random Boolean function and turn it into one of your quantum circuits? Right. So even for uh, non-Boolean functions, there actually is a, a methodology for doing it. In, but you have to do measurements at the end, of course, to, uh, you know, to do the non-reversible uh, aspect of it. But, but it essentially comes down to... Uh, tricks with control knots and uh, Toffoli gates, um, allowing you to uh, do things like XOR, um, which can be used as uh, a type. Of, yeah, you can do XOR with the C knot, and you can end up doing uh, and you know a very trivial AND operation. Uh, so, Toffoli. what you're telling me is that we should be able to have a compiler. Right, and that's something that I've talked to uh, Caesar and uh, Jose about, um, but we wanted to put that off until. Yeah, it's fine, fine. But I mean, so that that's then that's nice. So that's a compiler for for. So if we do that, we should also be able to compile solid automata, which are the same deal basically. Um, although there you end up with these two to two solid automata and so on. I have to go. It's it's okay. We're making good progress, um, and. Uh, um, um, oh gosh, people are asking all these questions here. This is what we, a cloud service for cloud deploy of quantum circuit, right? Yes. 
That's what we want to do, what we want to be able to have. If anybody actually ever has a quantum computer, we want to be able to take our quantum circuit description and simply uh, upload it to the quantum computer and have it be executed. Um, that would be, that's the goal. Right. And, um, uh, okay, so, so somebody here is saying back propagation is overrated, which I do tend to agree with. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay, so some, somebody is asking, what about hierarchical temporal networks, HTMs? Um, anybody know enough about, about Jeff Hawkins' stuff to be able to comment on whether that has a better quantum analog? Well, we have the wrong group of people here. Um, all right, okay, well, to be continued, um, bye to everybody on the live stream, bye to everybody on the meeting. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.